<clears throat> Thank you, Bob, for the introduction a few minutes ago, and uh, thanks for inviting me uh, today to talk about Lech Megantzik. Uh The first thing I want to mention, as you probably all know, this accident is under criminal investigation right now, so those of you that have been following the media uh, and following the, uh, the event ever since the accident occurred, you may not learn a lot more that you already know. Uh, I can only deal with the facts right now. Um, uh, Cynthia mentioned that something like that is, uh, uh, is a nightmare and keeps her awake at night. And I'll, uh, I'll never pretend that I can understand or imagine what the uh, people of Lac Megantic went through. But I can talk from our standpoint, and it's probably has been the worst uh, crisis we went through. And I think it was uh, personally hard on, on many of us. Uh, usually we, uh, we deal with an accident, it happens, then we deal with the aftermath. But this one, uh, uh, especially I'm from Quebec, so that, that's home from me, not Lac Megantic. But uh, the fact that, uh, you know, it starts with a phone call in the middle of the night, whereas usually in the past they used to, 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 uh, to call me for about everything, even 11 coal cars derailed uh, uh, in the middle of nowhere. So you, you kind of get used to these calls and, you know, okay, so uh, you know, TSB may send someone for the investigation. We may send an inspector. But when I got that phone call and the guy told me at 3.30, says it's... Uh, he said, we just had an accident like Megantic. It involves crude oil. There's a fire, and it's, it's pretty serious. Uh, I thought at the time that he was probably talking about evacuation and evacuation or something like that. And he says, no, it's a lot worse than that. I says, what do you mean it's a lot worse than that? He says, we're talking about multiple casualty. The worst that I had to deal with in my job was three at the same time, even with the rail industry, or uh, uh, including the regulator. And uh, what I said, what do you mean by, by several casualties? He says, we're talking maybe 35, 40, 50. I, I, I could just, I, it was impossible to just, just, just understand and believe what was going on. And the following days, you know, we're, we're trying to focus on our job and every day they're finding more and more casualties. So uh, like I said, I'll, I'll never pretend that what we went through is as hard as what the people from Megantic went through and they have all our sympathy. But it was uh, it was even really hard on the regulator to went through that event, and uh, uh, you kind of forget about the, it's hard to keep with your mandate, and, and and at the same time not being emotionally involved when it's on TV 24 hours a day. And my family was looking at it as well. So uh, I, I just hope that we, uh, for the sake of uh, not only for us but for the people of our country and the United States as well, that we would never go through again an accident like that. As far as the presentation is concerned, I'll, uh, the purpose uh, is to provide you uh, with an overview of the derailment that occurred at Lac Megantic. We'll talk about MMA a bit, the event leading to the accident, what we know, uh, the derailment itself, the af aftermath, the investigation, inspections that we've conducted. Uh, MMA stats, I moved them up, I changed the slide. We talk about the certificate of fitness, uh, emergency directive uh, that we've issued. The Section 19 order and, and what's what's coming next for us. Uh, Montreal, Maine, and Atlantic uh, started to operate in 2003, and uh, it was created by uh, under uh, World Rail, and it was actually four companies that came together: uh, Bangor and Aristook, uh, Canadian American Railway, Norton Vermont, and Southern Quebec, and they started to operate in 2003, and they own about 510 uh, miles of track. They would employ about 170 people and close to 75 in Quebec. Uh, they operate 15 trains on a daily basis and they have a fleet of about uh, 26 locomotives. Uh, MME connects to seven uh, other railways, whether they're class one regional and local railway, and they provide uh, rail link uh, between uh, Northern Maine, St. John's, New Brunswick, and Montreal. In addition, MME also offer access to port facilities on the Atlantic and St. John's, New Brunswick, and Seaport, Maine. Uh, since the Lac Megantic derailment, more than 55 workers have been laid off uh, so far. There's only a few left. And uh, as you probably know, on August 7, 2013, they filed for protection bankruptcy in Canada and in the US. That's, that's their network here uh, that we took off from the, their website. Uh, sorry, I, I don't have a laser here, but uh, 
The train originated from Newtown, North Dakota, and ended up in Montreal on the right side here, where it was inspected by Transport Canada 24 hours prior to the accident with no major defect on the train. Only two miners were found, and that's it. And the, tra the train went on, and I'll, I'll, I'll give you the sequence of event thereafter. And at Tet 45, it was, it was around between Sherbrooke and Lennoxville, then uh, uh, later on it, it stopped in Nantes, whereas they did their crew change, and not the crew change, but whereas uh, the crew change would occur about eight hours after the train was left there, and then train went down to, to reach Megantic after. Uh, just to show their accidents, uh, those were made public by, oh, thank you very much, those were made public by the TSB, uh, not too long after the, uh, usually the, you can access their stats, but they made a, I mean, a, uh, there was lots of requests from the medias and everybody wants to know about MMA, so they made those public. And as you can see on a TSB reportable, they uh, did have an improvement as reported to the TSB. The TSB in Canada doesn't work with a monetary threshold. So basically pretty much everything gets reported. For 2013, they had six uh, non-main track derailment and three main track derailment. So their safety record as reported to the TSB w wasn't that bad. Uh, it's on absolute number. It's not based on, uh, on a frequency. Uh, TSB only keeps the million train miles for the entire industry. They don't have them individually like they're available here in the States. So at, um, at 10.45, as I showed you uh, before, the uh, the train was proceeding eastward on the MME Sherbrooke subdivision uh, in order to get to its final de destination uh, in St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, what we know about the train was over 4,700 feet long, uh, a little over 10,000 ton, five Eden locomotive, one remote control car. As you know, they had single uh, person train operation. We'll get into that a bit later. One loaded box car that was uh, acting as a buffer car and 72 non-pressurized uh, tank cars loaded with petroleum crude oil, uh, DOT-111, these cars were. Um, 11 o'clock, the train stopped at the uh, designated MMA uh, crew change point, which is located in Nantes, uh, Quebec, about 7.4, 7.2 miles, uh, uh, I would say it's northwest from Megantic. And uh, so far, we still consider we, that the train wa was secured. Uh, we have no indication at this time uh, that the train was not properly secured. Uh, we had an accident in the, pack, in the past where as a, an employee had actually uh, comply with special instruction of the company, but the train still, for whatever reason, moved. So, so far, we still consider that may have been properly secured. The, investigation will, will tell us exactly what happened. Uh, locomotives were unlocked, which was not a regulatory requirement to lock them. Train attendant on the main line track descending on the 1.2 uh, two grade, and it's still unclear as to the number of end brakes that, that were applied. At 11.50, a local resident reported a fire on the locomotive. We still don't know what the nature of that fire was. Was it a fuel line? Was it oil on the manifold? Was electrical? We don't know. Uh, but by the timeline, you can see that it must have been very minor because it would, would have taken about only 10 minutes to, to put it out. Uh, then what happened after that, uh, I guess the investigation will eventually uh, reveal all of that for us. Did the, uh, the MME employee that was on site call his supervisor to try to get the locomotive engineer back to see if everything was all right? We don't know. We know the... Uh, Locomotive engineer was probably not contacted because he was not, uh, he, never, he never came back to the site. Uh, they shut down the locomotive. Uh, uh, if they had the independent brake on, probably after a while, they, 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 they slowly released. Uh, we, we, there's, there's nothing that, that has been confirmed so far. And we had uh, so many people calling us, uh, even pretty high up in some of the class one railway to tell us what happened, what they thought that happened. So we got uh, lots of version to deal with, but we will wait until the TSB confirms all of that. Uh, we don't know if the report will come out. Um, usually it's about 18 months. I don't know if this one could be a lot longer or could be a lot shorter uh, based on all the uh, 
uh, I guess, the expectation that are out there. But until uh, there's nothing that stops the TSB in the meantime to release a bit of information, and we'll see if they're doing that or not. So this is what we know so far about the accident. Um, shortly after 1 o'clock, uh, the train would uh, start to move and went down the 7.4 miles uh, slope leading to, uh, to Megantic. Uh, we don't know the speed that the train was going at. Uh, the only thing we know is probably what you've read as well from the witnesses that were outside when they saw the train coming to the uh, to town. They felt it could have been around 60 miles an hour, but maybe hard to judge with a train. But uh, all the witnesses, when they saw the train going by, they knew something was wrong because usually it was going about 10 miles an hour on that track. So uh, everyone noticed that... Uh, uh, something was wrong. The locomotive separated from the train and ended up upright one uh, half a mile east of the derailment. Uh, at 2 a.m., we said engineer used the track mobile to pull the nine cars that weren't derailed. Uh, we believe it was the actual engineer of that train that, that came back and uh, actually operated the track mobile to move the car that got that information from MMA. Uh, the aftermath, as, as you know, there's been 47 people that lost their life. 2,000 people were evacuated. There's been 125 business that were affected, and more than 675 people lost their job, which is something really big for a uh, city the size of, of Megantic. Uh, there's also a certain quantity of spilled oil found that found its way in uh, La Rivière Chaudière. Uh, uh, however, there's... Uh, we don't have, I can, I would say, firm confirmation of how much, because there's a lot of people speculating that it's a lot, it's not a lot. So we, we're still waiting to see uh, what's the exact quantity. A lot of the, the, the oil, I think, evaporated, and I'll show you a picture later. We may not see the oil, but we had an aircraft that we have at the government that uh, has the ability to evaluate the quantity of oil in water plants. So uh, uh, they found it was a lot at the beginning, but slowly it was, uh, was getting a bit less. Um, took that picture off the uh, Google Earth, and it shows you the uh, that's the per the, the uh, perimeter that was mostly damaged, but it was also so damaged around here. And I'll uh, draw your attention right on this uh, building here, the black building here, which is called the uh, Music Cafe, which is a pub, a bar, which is an institution in Lake Megantic which was packed people uh, when the accident occurred. Got to track here, and the train came from, from the top here and would have derailed around here. And you'll see some more pictures. So that's, that's, the, that's the downtown area. This picture is taken from our aircraft that uh, measures oil spills. And you can see that uh, uh, what I showed you before, that would be that, that, that red zone that I had. It's pretty much destroyed. But I'll have clearer picture to show you. But you see the extent of the damage here and all the, the tank cars that are, that are piled up here. Uh, this one here is uh, one that was shown by the FRA before. Uh, the music cafe would have been here somewhere. So as you can see, completely disappear. I, I was unable to find how many casualty, how many people uh, lost their life in, uh, uh, in that bar. But I think a great majority were there when, when it happened. And you can see that pretty much everything here is completely gone. Uh, some, uh, some businesses, some houses as far as here, and there's even some damage in that area. So uh, it's pretty extensive. They, uh, they evaluate the damages so far about 200 million. Uh, another picture from a different angle. Uh, that, that pub there was right here. So, uh, and again, you see that that was a dollar store right here. And uh, you see all the cars piled up in that area. And the locomotive are down here somewhere further down. So that, that soil here that uh, has, has gone through there. And there's also some damage because it flown back to the river. would be here somewhere. That's another picture of the, uh, you see all the tank cars. Uh, if, you, if you look at the box here, that would be right where the music cafe was located, where the, uh, all the people gathered that night. So uh, you can see the extent of the damage. And that's another one uh, that shows you uh, two cars left. It was a total of 57 vehicles uh, that were destroyed. 
By the way, all these pictures are available either on the TSB's website or on the internet. I mean, this is where we got them. Uh, the investigation, um, obviously the uh, Transportation Safety Board is conducting a full investigation to de determine the cause and the contributing factor. And uh, we can expect probably some updates from time to time on what, what they're finding. They've completed their, their field work. They left the, the site about uh, a few weeks ago. Now they're concentrating on analyzing everything, all the evidence that they gathered. They're working in their lab. Uh, Transport Canada, we also obtained warrants and we're doing actually investigating. We do not have the mandate to investigate for cause when the TSB is doing it, but we still have the, uh, the authority to investigate for regulatory compliance. So we have to invest, we, we got warrants to investigate uh, under the Railway Safety Act as well as under the Transportation of Dangerous Good, good Hack. Environment Canada is also conducting an, uh, an investigation for possible infraction under its relevant legislation and regulation. And La Sûreté du Québec, which is the provincial police, which would be the equivalent of a state police uh, here, is conducting a criminal investigation. And as opposed to uh, what's of some of the media had reported that apparently everybody were stepping over each other, the feedback we got from our people on the, on the site, it was working extremely well between all agencies and they uh, are a great level of cooperation. Those are the one investigating, but there's more agencies on the site as well, which are not investigating, but are monitoring. Uh, inspections. Um, we did inspect in right after the accident the entire uh, trackage of MMA in Canada, thanks again to, to Bob. And uh, uh, we were able to use their track geometry car from uh, the U.S. border to Mac Lake Megantic because I think you, they were not far from there doing work. So they, uh, they assisted us and it was really appreciated. And we ran our own track evaluation car from the uh, northwest uh, extremity of MMA down to uh, to Nantes and uh, we found things that uh, was reported to MMA uh, nothing major to be honest because track speed was uh, was not uh, was not very high so they were in compliance with our track safety rule but some issues on January 8th and maybe some of you have seen that because it was on YouTube uh, we got someone who got onto an MMA train with a camera and walking all over the train walking in the cab of the locomotive and showing that the train had not been secured so that was uh, two days after the accident and uh, so uh, we had to issue an order to MMA to properly secure that train and um, Talk about a bridge here that uh, we did issue a notice in order that was reported by, by, by residents, uh, obviously. And I think we can understand that, that people of Lac Megantic and people in many, many other areas in Canada are highly concerned about rail safety right now. So we do have uh, probably thousands of people inspecting right now and giving us a hand and reporting things. So we sent someone and the, res the residents were right. It was not structural on the bridge. It was the, guard, uh, the guardrails, but... Uh, uh, we had to issue notice to get it fixed and there was other areas as well on the network of MMA that uh, we did found some uh, some non-compliance that, that were addressed, but we do have a lot of people now assisting us. Um, MMA certificate of fitness and um, under the, uh, just the history, that on, on August 13, the Canadian Transportation in, in, uh, Agency uh, advise MMA that their certificate would be suspended on August 20 for not having enough uh, insurance to cover liability. On August 23rd, the CTA gave an MMA an extension till October 1st. And obviously now it, it launched a debate uh, in Canada anyway. Uh, do companies have enough money to cover enough insurance to cover liabilities? Uh, under the Railway Safety Act, and we were, uh, a lot of people questioned us about that. Why have we not suspended their, sec their certificate of operations? Simply because they don't have one in Canada, uh, issued under the Railway Safety Act. That was a void that was addressed in the latest Railway Safety Act review, and our act was amended on May 1st. Now we have the authority to make regulation uh, to uh, request from every railway 
uh, to comply with safety with with certain safety requirement in order to get a safety operating certificate, uh, we call that an ROC railway operating certificate. However, the regulation has not been developed yet because our process takes about uh, when with consultation and everything close to 18 months. So we had no no authority to suspend MMA from operating. Uh, however, the CTA uh, could do it if the company did not have enough money to cover liability, and that was the case. However, they've been authorized to, uh, um, to, to operate until October 1st. I read somewhere that apparently they were able to, to find a quarter of a million to, to pay their insurers back, but that, uh, don't, don't quote me on that. I, I got that on the net. So. Uh, and that has launched a debate in Canada right now that they want to eventually revise all of that for all company. Do they have enough money? to cover liability. I don't think anyone would have expected something like that to happen. Uh, the emergency directive, we issued an emergency directive on, on July 23rd, and I'll get into the, uh, the emergency directive. It was the <coughs> rail safety was, was created in 1989, uh, way, way before my time, when they, uh, they got rid of the Canadian Trans uh, Transportation Commission and they created three separate agencies out of that. They created the Transportation Safety Board as an independent body. They gave rail safety and they extracted from the Railway Act. They created the Railway Safety Act and gave that to Transport Canada. And the NTA, which is a National Transportation Agency, which is the CTA right now, changed name in 96, Canadian Transportation Agency, uh, kept the economic aspect of the business. It was separated. So since 1989, we only issued four, four emergency directive. Uh, one was issued in 2002, if I remember correctly, for uh, switch left in, uh, had to do with switch uh, left in reverse position in dark territory, so we addressed that. 2008, we issued one with defective wheels uh, that came out of a wheel shop, and actually they were scattered all over the uh, both countries, so we had to ask the railways to try to find where these wheels were. Uh, recently, we did one, um, uh, I think it was three days before Megantzik, when the Bonnybrook uh, Bridge uh, partially collapsed due to the floods in, in, uh, in Alberta. Then we issued the fourth one. Uh, however, the first three were issued, uh, I'd say, strictly by us, where, whereas this one, obviously, uh, everybody wanted to get involved. The minister's office obviously wanted to brief, and uh, so we took a bit more time to, to get this one together, but, uh, and I'll show you what we have in it. Um, basically, it requires from all rail operators to file their special instruction regarding the application of, of handbrake with Transport Canada. That's another section of the Act. Emergency Directive is done under 33. Requiring railway to file was done under 36, so we gave them two order. Uh, the emergency directive will remain in effect until December 31st. We have the ability to, uh, to extend it by another six months if by that time we haven't got uh, change in the rule done with industry, so we, uh, we still have, are able to, uh, to extend that. And obviously, uh, here it says Transport Canada will be carrying an additional inspection to monitor compliance to the emergency directive. We're on it for the past uh, two to three weeks. And we're glad to report that we have 100% compliance from all railways so far. And we did a lot of inspections. So uh, uh, everybody has been in compliance with the emergency directive so far. Uh, what the emergency directive entails, uh, we're talking about uh, ensure that no locomotive attached to one or more loaded tank car transporting, uh, transporting their engine's good is operated with fewer than two qualified persons on main tracker sidings. Uh, ensure that no locomotive attached to one or more loaded tank car transporting uh, DGs is left unattended on the main track. Ensure that within five days, we gave five days uh, uh, to industry to, uh, to comply with uh, locking the doors, because when we met with some of the railways, they basically told us that they couldn't find the keys anyway, so they needed a bit more time to, to uh, find all their keys and uh, and some locomotive probably put some padlocks and chains if uh, they had no ability to lock them. So we give them five days for that. Um, uh, as well, uh, has the uh, railways to remove the reversers uh, from the locomotives. 
uh, and the uh, last two honestly could have been combined into one. We basically ask for more than an hour to comply with special instruction and rule 112. So to put the proper amount of handbrakes to make sure that the train won't move and do a push-pull test. And somehow I may have got lost in translation a bit. The one for less than an hour is a lot more restrictive where we're asking railway to apply the automatic brake as well as the independent brake. And uh, please don't ask me to explain the rationale of this one. I guess it got simply, it was so many people involved at the last minute it was thrown in, but uh, those are temporary measures. So we'll revise that in the rules, see if it needs to be changed. But someone in the department really want the less than one hour to be a lot more prescriptive than, uh, than the uh, more than an hour. We also uh, ordered the industry to uh, um, to file under Section 19 a revision of uh, of the rules of uh, of operating rules. Uh, it would be a revision and some addition as well because we had nothing for the securement of locomotives, so we want that to be addressed. Prevention of uncontrolled movement and crew size requirements for certain situation. Uh, the railway have until November 20, 2013 to formulate the rule and submit them to TC. However, we, we know it may be a tight deadline, so as long as we're protected by the emergency directive, if we, nobody can't really meet that deadline, we, we could consider uh, it's a, uh, providing probably another six months to, uh, to file the rule. Uh, what's next? Uh, reviewing special instruction for handbrakes. Uh, Railway Association, Association of Canada and the rail companies to develop the rule under Section 19. Obviously, as you can understand, the, uh, the towns, the communities, the municipalities were uh, really, really concerned about what happened. Uh, like in the States, we got train going through thousands of towns in Canada. Everybody, and we can understand that, are, are concerned that something may happen. So uh, uh, they've asked most of the municipalities, but the municipalities are all a regroup in Canada under something called the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, which represents all municipalities. And they, uh, they basically wants, want to be consulted in the future about, uh, about our regulation. Uh, so uh, there's a certain commitment that we would work with these people and um, on regulatory requirement as well as uh, they're, they're, I think for the most part their, their, uh, their reaction so far has been extremely constructive. I think at first like anybody else they were highly concerned about what happened but now they really want to work with us and really want to make it safe. So I think there's three things that they really want. Number one, that when trains are going through their, first they want to know what goods are going through their, uh, their town. They want, it, they want it to be as safe as possible to reach an optimum level of safety. And they want to be prepared if something happens. So they're really working with us on that. And there's a strong commitment from our minister to, to, to work with them. So this is where we're at uh, so far with the, uh, the, uh, the Lac Megantic accident. So that, that's what I had for you this morning. So a few questions or, yeah? Thank you very much for, for that briefing, Luke. Uh, do we have any questions from the, the members around the table? Oops. Yes, sir. Ross. Railroad passengers. Um, in, in frame 19, you refer to, in the first bullet, uh, the requirement for two qualified persons on the main track or siding. And then in frame 21, uh, which is an emergency directive, and then frame 21 uh, refers to the railways have until November 20th, and one of the issues there is crew size requirements for certain yeah. situations. Does that mean that uh, the potential exists to identify additional situations where crew size would be effective, or what's the relationship between those two uh, things? Uh, MMA was, uh, was operating with one-man operation, and we had only two railways in Canada that had the single-person uh, train operation. We had uh, Quebec North Shore and Labrador, which had been operating since 1996. 
uh, with only uh, one-man crew. Uh, it started with MMA in around 2009 from, uh, from the border to Megatsik for about 23 miles. And then uh, in 2009 as well, uh, MMA had started to work with Transport Canada to expand that to other section of their network. But we worked for four years with them, uh, requesting risk assessment, uh, requiring consultation with municipalities. We've launched an international study commissioned by the uh, national, the uh, Kenyan National Research Council in order to try to get that safely, uh, do, do, do it safely. Um, to answer your question, I guess the potential in the, is there that everything will be revised. That's, that's the question at this time. We're going to look at everything. Was it a contributing factor? We don't know. TSB may determine it was, but in the meantime, we want to revise everything. Thank you. Do we have any other questions from the table? Yes, sir. Uh, Luke, uh, Bob Vanderkloot with the Association of American Railroads. Uh, the uh, way bill indicated in your presentation indicated that uh, the product was packing group three and that seemed a bit unusual for the explosive nature of the derailment. Uh, I understand that uh, samples have been taken from the car. Would you care to comment on that at all? Uh, you know as much as I know, I guess. That's all I can say. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? I really want to thank Luke for traveling uh, down to the United States to give us this briefing. Um, this is this is a very sobering presentation. And I want to want to thank you uh, for being willing to do that. Um, and uh, you know, if there's no other questions, uh, let's give uh, Luke one more round of applause. Thank you very much. Thanks.